Hey everybody, welcome to our class series, Life with God. My name is Jeff Childers and I'm one of the co-teachers of this series. This is a six part series and this is part two. In part one, we talked about how rich a life with God could be, but also how challenging because it's not only about relationship with God, but how that we have to make ourselves available for transformation to serve the mission of God. Relationship, transformation, and mission. Today, we want to talk about life with God together because every one of us experiences life with God a little differently. And that's okay. That's not necessarily a problem because each one of us has the potential to open up a different aspect of who God is. But none of us is able to open up everything about who God is, and that's why we need each other. So hopefully today, by the end of this lesson, we'll have a little better understanding of ourselves, the distinct ways that uh, each of us approaches God, and also maybe a little better appreciation for other people too and their distinct ways of approaching uh, God. But in order to proceed, what we're going to need to do is for you to get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil uh, and to uh, write down some numbers in the following survey. I'm going to work through a series of questions. There are several questions, and each one of the questions will have four different possible answers. You should pick one of those answers, one, two, three, or four. Pick whichever one you feel best describes you. They're all right answers. There are no wrong answers. It's just that I'd like you to pick one and one only that is the one that best characterizes you personally. So hopefully you can get something to write with and a pen or pencil. And as we go through each question, you may want to pause the recording to look at the answers uh, more closely. But I encourage you uh, not to overthink it and not to take too long. It's really a, a simple exercise designed to give ourselves an informal portrait of our, our own characteristics and tendencies spiritually. Okay? Question A. Worship is best when, one, a carefully prepared worship experience comes together in a thoughtful way. Two, we can spontaneously express ourselves from the heart. Three, the service has a simple beauty in times of silence. Or four, the important thing is not a worship service, but preparing our lives for God's service in the world. Write down one, two, three, or four for question A as quickly as you can, and we'll go to the next question. Letter B, participation. Number one, it's best when people who have something meaningful to say are the ones who do most of the talking. Number two, everybody should have a chance to share and contribute something. Number three, we're better off when we listen for God rather than having many people speak. Number four, I like it when things are well run and we accomplish something practical. Question C, about prayer. Number one, we pray to seek knowledge, guidance, and help. Number two, we pray so the words and feelings can move us into God's presence. Number three, words don't matter. I'd rather just empty my mind of distractions and simply be in the presence of God. Or number four, my life and my work for God and others are really my best prayer. Question D, being together. Number one, when we're together, we learn about God from each other. Number two, being closer to each other makes me feel closer to God. Number three, often I prefer to be alone. Number four, the best times together are when we're working on a project to help someone. Question E, it really bothers me when, number one, people don't seem to understand what Christianity is about. Number two, all the traditions and institutional stuff get in the way of a personal relationship with God. Number three, so much is going on in my life that I just can't get centered in God's presence. Or number four, Christians don't seem to care enough about people who are hurting 
or in need? Which of these bothers you the most? Question F, preaching. Number one, I love it when a lesson teaches me something new or reminds me of something important. Number two, a lesson was good if it stirred my heart or convicted me. Number three, we hear God's word mainly when the Spirit speaks to our hearts. Or number four, the best preaching is what we do. Actions speak louder than words. Question G. I love it when, number one, I get to ask questions and discuss difficult topics. Number two, we have exciting worship together and I can feel the energy. Number three, we get away from it all and have quiet times with God. Or number four, we go somewhere to help the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. Question H. We evangelize better when we can, number one, explain what we believe to non-Christians, or number two, welcome non-Christians into close community and bring them to exciting worship experiences. Number three, be examples of simple and peaceful living. Or number four, show God's love by helping people in need and making the world a better place. And question I, as Christians, we need more, number one, serious Bible study and religious knowledge. Number two, praise times and fellowship. Number three, spiritual disciplines and retreats. Number four, we need more Christian service projects and mission trips. J, knowing God, number one, God reveals himself best in the Bible and in Jesus. Number two, I can feel that God is real and that Jesus lives in my heart. Number three, God is a mystery too deep to be understood or known. Or number four, we meet God when we're out doing his work in the world. And letter K, the main thing is, number one, to learn who God is, understand what he wants, and obey him. Number two, to have a personal relationship with the Lord. Number three, to be still and rest in God. Or number four, to see where God is working in the world and help. As you can see, they're all good answers and there are probably some of those questions that it was very difficult for you to decide which of them best characterizes you. But I hope that you were able to pick a number one or two or a three or a four for each one. What I'd like you to do now is draw a circle or a pie and then divide the pie up into four squares and number them just like you see on the screen. One, two, three, four, clockwise. And then I'd like you to count up the numbers that you wrote down going through the survey. And for every number one that you wrote down, put a little line in that slice of the pie or that quadrant of your circle and make a, a new slice there. Chances are you're going to have lines in different places, uh, but the chances are also good that most of us are going to have more lines in one or two of these quadrants than in some of the others. Now, I realize this is not a, this is not a scientific way of getting at your spiritual preferences or your preferred styles of spirituality. It's really just uh, an opportunity to step back and ask some questions of ourselves about the kinds of things that seem to feed us most or get us most energized, the things that we affirm the most when they happen well. And by reflecting on those, that helps us understand a little bit more about our leanings as people pursuing a life with God. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is to spend a little time exploring that landscape. The circle with the four quadrants. I'm adapting um, a, a model that comes from Urban Holmes' research on the history of spirituality, and there's nothing magical about it, and there's nothing scientific about it. It's just a way of talking about spiritual tendencies and trends uh, in our own lives and maybe in our communities as well. So let me explain a little bit about this circle and what it means. We all have a head. We all have a brain that thinks. 
We know how to work through ideas. We have memories that remember facts. We know how to put concepts together and explain things. And that is one of the ways that God shows himself to us. It's one of the ways that we get closer to God. We use our heads, our abilities to think and reason, our abilities to remember. Uh, that, uh, that opens up some things to us about God. So I'm using that to talk about the capacity that every one of us has to know God with our heads. But we also have hearts, right? And this is that part of ourselves that uh, is more emotional and more intuitive, more interpersonally connected. Um, we, th th this isn't a part of the body. Uh, obviously, I'm not talking about physiology here, right? I'm just using these words to describe characteristics that we have. We have brains with heads that are able to remember and think, but we also have hearts that are able to feel and have compassion and relate interpersonally in more intuitive ways. Well, when it comes to experiencing God, it's often the case that each of us will tend more towards a head side or a heart side, at least much of the time, uh, although that can change depending on the season of our lives and some of the experiences that we've had. But I want to draw this line here, which is sort of a spectrum and wonder if you see yourself as more of a head person when it comes to approaching God or more of a heart person. God has revealed himself to us in many different ways, right? He's revealed himself to us in scripture that we read and study and discuss. He's revealed himself to us in nature. The natural world uh, reveals many things to us about God. And he even reveals himself to us in our own hearts. God is a God who has revealed himself. And some of us are especially attuned to those positive revelations of God, the ways in which God has made himself known, and we feel confident that we know him because of the things that he's said, the things that he's done, and we connect with those ways of God's revealing himself. However, God is also a God of great mystery. There is no chance that any of us can know everything about God. There are many things about God we don't understand. That's what makes him God. And uh, there are depths to his character and his, uh, his motives and his purposes that we just simply can't understand. God is mysterious. And some of us are more in tune with the God of mystery, the God who is a big question mark. Not so many answers, but more questions. The hidden God, the God who isn't fully known uh, and can't really be easily comprehended. And of course, we could talk about this being on a spectrum too, where some of us lean more in the direction of the revealed God and some more in the direction of the God of mystery. This is just a tool to help us talk about these different aspects of what it means to pursue a relationship with God. Uh, this is not, uh, not revealed to us from on high and doesn't have any more authority than, uh, than, than its usefulness. If it's useful to help us talk about some things, then that's good. You'll notice the circle gets split up into the four quadrants, the rational, the experiential, the kingdom, and the mystical quadrant. And yes, the pie slices that you drew a few minutes ago are supposed to indicate some things about where your primary leanings or tendencies or preferred styles are. Let's talk about each one of these quadrants in a little more detail. First, the rational quadrant. This is the quadrant for those people who uh, are rational in their disposition, and they have a lot of confidence about how God reveals himself, that God has made himself known, especially in scripture. And so people that live in this quadrant are people who are really hungry for theological renewal, and they think that's what people most need, and what the church most needs is theological renewal. They like to learn the facts of the faith. They like to ponder them, to memorize them. They like to discuss them, and they like to go as deep as they can in understanding those things. They're also very concerned about right thinking. They want you to get it right. 
there are right answers. Uh, God is something in particular, and he's revealed some things. So uh, people that are most comfortable in this quadrant put a high priority on careful thinking and right thinking in our ap approaches to God. They also like to talk about the whys, not just the what's, what are the facts, what is the data, but also why. Why do we believe in God? What are the reasons for this and for that? And they love discussions uh, that do that. They love blogs on the internet that go into those kinds of things. Uh, they love Bible classes that focus mostly on this sort of thing. And for them, good spiritual practice leads to insight. When they walk away from a worship service and say, that was a great service, chances are good it's because something was said in a sermon that was uh, very clever or uh, very clear and uh, something that reaffirmed a belief that they had or perhaps opened up new insights um, into their, their own beliefs and their own knowledge. People who live in these quadrants affirm a kind of confidence about how we can know God and they affirm uh, rehearsing that knowledge in our studies and in our conversations with each other and really want us to worship in ways that activate all of these priorities. I bet some of you fit in the rational quadrant, or at least partly in the rational quadrant. The second quadrant that we want to talk about is the experiential one. And this quadrant is to help us understand those people who also have a high degree of confidence that God's revealed himself. God makes himself known, but he makes himself known in our experiences. He makes himself known within my heart. So people that live in the experiential quadrant tend to be people who are craving personal renewal. And that's what they think the church most needs. And that's what the church's ministries need to be aimed at and need to be all about personal renewal. So they put a, a high premium on emotions, feelings, and also on the expression of those emotions. They like to hug and they like to see demonstrative worship uh, when we gather together for worship. They love things that are concrete and hands-on. They like being involved uh, in, uh, in things uh, so that they can experience them directly and that immediate interaction with someone else or with some other, uh, with, with some activity uh, really counts for a lot with them when it comes to getting close to God. They're often very concerned about those ways we demonstrate purity and holiness. Those are very concrete things. For them, the experiential person, good spiritual practice leads to presence and personal testimony. Personal relationship with the Lord is like the slogan of this, of this particular quadrant. And they like it when people are sharing stories from the heart about what they've experienced. They're not as concerned to make sure all those stories are accurate or are getting all the facts right. That's more of a rational quadrant thing. They're mostly concerned that they be sincere. And if they're sincere, well, that's sort of what the experiential quadrant is looking for. Then there's the quadrant of social renewal in the upper left. These are people who tend to be head-oriented. They think a lot. They read a lot. Um, they're concerned. They, they reflect uh, about the world's ills. They don't necessarily have as much confidence, though, as the people on the revealed God side that everybody's figured everything out about God. Um, there's a lot of mystery when it comes to God, and especially when confronting some of the real problems in the world that seem um, insoluble and are very puzzling. Why is God letting this happen? These are, are people who tend to grapple with those kinds of questions. Maybe they're just wired that way, or maybe uh, I've seen people who've had an experience in their lives that has brought them sort of face to face with something really difficult, some trauma that they just couldn't explain. And that moved them maybe from one of the other quadrants into this quadrant. But these people are convinced that there are some things that uh, God wants us to do. He wants us to love our neighbors. These people are very interested in social action. This is a quadrant that focuses on the pursuit of justice and is looking for the renewal of peace in the world. 
They really want things to be relevant. Tell me how this makes a difference in the real world. And they like going out into the world. They're as likely to listen to what the world's saying about uh, who the church needs to be as they are about what about uh, as they are to listen to the voices inside the church about how, who the church needs to be. And they're likely to affirm things that get out of the building and out um, into the neighborhoods as they are things that happen as part of the institutional church. For them, good spiritual practice leads to action and testimony. Not the kind of testimony that the experiential quadrant loves, not the tell me your story in a sincere way. Um, it's more the testimony from the front lines. Tell me what was happening when you were working with those people in that neighborhood and give us a sense of what that was like. That kind of testimony from the front lines of kingdom action uh, is something that people in this quadrant crave. And then finally, in the lower left quadrant is a quadrant that's probably one of the hardest for many of us to understand. It's the quadrant of the mystics. These are people who also embrace fully the mystery of God. They believe that God is too deep to be comprehended. Uh, and in fact, are pretty suspicious of all the ways some of the other quadrants have of trying to get at God and to define God. Uh, but they're more heart-oriented. They're more intuitive, perhaps more artistic, more uh, interested in aesthetics um, and the, the texture of, 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 of aesthetic, and that that gets them in touch with God. These are people who uh, practice contemplation and stillness and quiet. They're interested in inner peace. They tend to do things in more passive ways. They would like to spend more time in quietness than in aggressive activity. They're big on self-denial. What are the things you're giving up? Not what are we doing as a church and consuming as a church, but what are the things we're surrendering and giving up as a church or as individuals? And so they're very interested in simplicity as well. Some of the other quadrants find their fulfillment in adding more and more and more and turning the volume up. But this quadrant really wants to do the opposite because for them, good spiritual practice is something that leads to unity with God. That's what they're, that's what they're really seeking, a kind of oneness with God. Okay, so this is, this is the whole circle in a really quick summary of each of the quadrants. And uh, the survey questions may have put you more in one of these quadrants than another. Uh, or maybe in a couple of these quadrants, pretty equally distributed. I know nobody likes to be pigeonholed in this way. And uh, some of you may be thinking, well, there's no way you're going to use a circle like this to pin down exactly where I'm at as a spiritual person with God. And I, I understand. I get that. I also know which quadrant you probably belong to. But honestly... Uh, seriously, this is just meant to be a tool to help us talk about some of the tendencies that we have as spiritual people, asking the question, where do I fit? Where am I? Am I more head-oriented or more heart-oriented? Do I tend to embrace more confidently the revealed God, uh, the one who's revealed in Scripture and, and exciting, dynamic worship experiences and the stories of people's hearts? Or am I more a person who embraces the mystery of God and is often raising questions and uh, entertaining doubts and encouraging the expression of doubts in ways that the other quadrants find a little uncomfortable? This is just meant to help us understand a little bit about ourselves. It's interesting to think about where we might be as individuals but it's not just individuals who fit into certain quadrants. Sometimes whole religious traditions fit into certain quadrants. If, you're, uh, if you come from churches of Christ, like I do, many of us at Highland do, then you might recognize the rational quadrant is a pretty familiar one. One that uh, is a part of the great strength of the heritage of churches of Christ, which puts a high degree of emphasis on our ability to figure some things out and on the ways in which God has clearly revealed himself in Scripture. 
Then, in recent decades, more churches of Christ have experienced moves, maybe from the rational quadrant to the experiential quadrant. Uh, the worship renewal movement, for example, and some other practices, I think, sort of have, have, have been showing up more in some church context, showing that they're mainly playing to this quadrant. And then, more recently, and this year in particular, I think many people find themselves drawn to the kingdom quadrant of practical action out in the world, away from the building, away from uh, public worship to, be, bring, to bring peace into the lives of people in the world in the name of Jesus. Uh, the fact is you can change. You can be one thing or another thing and maybe change over time for one reason or another, or you might find yourself pretty evenly spread across one quadrant or another quadrant. But I suppose the really pressing question is, which quadrant's the right one? You know, where is Jesus in this? Ah, Jesus knows his Bible very well and he's able to engage theological discussion at an erudite level. Erudite, you might wanna look it up. It's a rational quadrant word and it's something Jesus does because he's in the rational quadrant. But he also embraces this intimate relationship with his father. He enjoys being with his friends. He goes to, to banquets. He's in worship in the synagogue. He goes to worship in the temple. Jesus is an experiential person as well. And he sometimes behaves and speaks in ways that fit that lower right-hand quadrant. And we know Jesus is out doing ministry amongst the poor and the needy, that he is willing to give himself up and move out away from the religious institution to engage people in the world, uh, to bring uh, ministries of compassion and peacemaking to people. We know that. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but Jesus is a mystic. The Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus retreating all night for prayer, that's a mighty long prayer list if he's just listing a bunch of things that he wants God to do for him. Um, I think Jesus is a practitioner of contemplative Jewish practices of his day. And we see him fasting. We see him retreating into the wilderness for long periods. Uh, we see him surrendering himself and giving things up. Uh, and I think that what that means is Jesus is sort of all over this circle. I think Jesus knows who to be when. He knows how to function well in all of these areas. And so Jesus shows up all around this landscape in each of the quadrants, knowing what to do when, what to say when, and he cultivates the practices that are associated with all of the quadrants. It's not surprising because we see them all being affirmed in Scripture in different ways and at different times. Uh, and each of these things opens up aspects of God or aspects of the human relationship with God. They're all important. They're all important areas. Now, it may be the case that I'm able to open up some um, aspect of who Christ is because I have a particular strength and a particular preferred style, a particular way of functioning that tends to be my way of functioning. I fit in the rational quadrant. A bunch of you are going, well, that's obvious, or we wouldn't have this lesson, because this is a rational approach to the whole thing. And that's true, that's very true. So there may be something about who Christ is that I'm able to open up, because this is one of my strengths. But I can't open up everything there is to open up about Christ, and I can't bring everything that Jesus is to the world. That's why we have a body. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, both talk about the importance of body and how that the body consists of different parts, and each part's a little different, and it brings different strengths to the table. One of my favorite passages is Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. In Ephesians 4, there's this vision of a body of different parts, and each has been gifted by God to do different things, but they're joined together, bone and sinew and muscle. And as they're working together and moving 
together, uh, that's, that generates a kind of dynamic energy in the body that gets things done and also accomplishes the growth of the body, uh, growing up into him who is the head, Ephesians 4 says. Not me by myself, but me as a part of a body working together, that's what actually grows up into Christ. So that key aspect of the Christian spiritual life, which is about transformation and growth into Christ-likeness, doesn't just happen within me personally. It happens partly because I'm connected to members of a body who are gifted differently and have different experiences. And that includes the ways in which we approach God, the different things that tend to feed us spiritually, the different ways that uh, we, uh, we practice feeling close to God, and some of them are more head-oriented, some more heart-oriented, some embrace God's revealed self and are more interpersonal, some uh, embrace the mystery of God. I can't do all of those things. I want to play to my strengths, but also I want to understand better people who live in different quadrants, who experience things differently. And I want to grow in those areas too. Maybe I'm uh, an experiential person, but being an experiential person does not give me a buy on loving my neighbor, right? Loving, loving your neighbor is also a, a thing any Christian should do. There are aspects of all of these quadrants that every Christian should uh, try to practice and cultivate and grow stronger in, even if it is the case that there might be a particular slice of the pie that is more like your slice of the pie. You can play to your strengths. You can find ways to serve that will uh, utilize those strengths. But hopefully we can also learn how to be appreciative of other strengths and how to work alongside them in their areas because we need each other. In my own faith journey, there have been plenty of times when being rational doesn't get it. What I most needed was not an intelligent answer to a critical question. What I most needed was a really great hug from a person who knows how to give one in the name of Jesus. And that lifts me up and fills me with life. And we correct each other too. We correct each other because we have these different tendencies. You know, people up in the uh, kingdom quadrant feel very critical sometimes of people in the experiential quadrant. And they say, what's the deal? You're spending all your money, all your time and your own little worship parties. And you think that that's what God really wants. When in fact, he wants the hungry to be fed and the sick to be tended and justice to happen in the world. And you can quote lots of passages to support that. There's a truth there. And uh, the experiential quadrant people need to hear that. The kingdom quadrant people need to hear some on the other side as well, that there is a place for a retreat from the world into uh, worship that celebrates the real world of God's heavenly order, but also that not all evil is systemic and social. A lot of it's personal. A lot of the evil out there in the world that's causing suffering is because of stupid things people do because uh, we're sinners. And the experiential quadrant specializes in challenging people on their personal sins, which also needs to be done along with an appreciation for the way that systemic and social evil has to be addressed too. And it's when these people that uh, open up different aspects of God are talking to each other and sharpening each other and helping each other see things about spirituality and about God that they might not see if all they ever did was play to their own strengths or spend time in activities that, uh, that just suit their own style. So when it comes to cultivating the spiritual life, this helps, I think. It, it helps to have a clearer sense of what my preferred spiritual styles are, why I'm more likely to pat someone on the back when they've done a certain thing, and less likely to be that moved by something else. And then knowing that, it helps me to appreciate that there are other people who are going to grow in because of different things or who are going to be fed in different ways. And thinking about our mission of helping each other grow in Christ-likeness and of reaching out to the world, well, we want to bring 
all of that to the world. We want to bring the entire body of Christ, all of the different ways the body of Christ opens up the nature and the mission of God to the world, not just a slice of it, not just a corner of it, not just one of these quadrants. So what we would like to be ideally is a church that cultivates all of these, a church that affirms all of these, a church that gives people opportunities for growth in all of these areas, and a church that challenges each one of us, not just to play to our strengths and be satisfied with that, but also to find ways to practice uh, in the other quadrants and uh, appreciating the strengths of others and learning how to work alongside them in the things that are uh, most impactful to them and that are bound to be impactful, most impactful on some people in the world in, in our mission because people are not all reached in identical ways. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy because we have a tendency to gravitate towards people who are more like us rather than to cultivate the patience and the appreciation that has to be there to be with people who aren't like us and uh, to create space for their ways of approaching God, even as we encourage them to appreciate uh, our own ways. Hopefully, this conversation about a landscape model has been helpful to you to get a sense of uh, who you are spiritually, what kinds of things that you gravitate towards, and maybe why that is, how that may have changed over time, and hopefully to give us some language to talk about those things, uh, because spiritual matters can be very difficult to talk about, uh, be, partly just because we, we don't have the language and because we're trying to grab something that's mysterious and not easily described. Uh, but just learning some terms and kind of putting things in relationship to each other gives us a picture and gives us some language that we can use to talk to one another. Each of the four quadrants cares a lot about scripture and spends time in it. Each of the four quadrants engages in worship. Each of the four quadrants engages in prayer. Each of the four quadrants has a concern for confronting uh, the, the mission out there in the world and, and bringing God's hope to people. But they're all doing it in somewhat different ways. Uh, they're all biblical ways. They're all ways we see in Jesus himself. One of the challenges for us is to learn to be as full-bodied as Scripture is, as full-bodied as Christ himself is, in appreciating these different arenas of activity, different approaches to Scripture, different uh, approaches to worship, different preferred practices when it comes to Christian fellowship, different understandings of how to embody the mission of God in the world. It has a lot of impact on our understanding and our practice of our spiritual lives.